And hi, everybody. Welcome to the February 21st uh, University Open Source Meeting. It's great to have all of you here. Share my screen. Just a second. Oh, right there. Um, all right. So, yeah, today's question, yeah, how long would you drive before you just think about flying? A lot of good answers in here. Um, Angela, I think living in Texas, I've lived in Texas too. Like, I, I don't even understand distances in that state sometimes. <laughs> you can just drive forever and you're still in Texas. <laughs> I think if you go from El Paso or like the corner to the other side, I think it's like 13 hours across the state, which is just mind blowing. But it's also like equidistant from like the the longest the longest like road trip you can do across texas is the same as driving from texas to canada <laughs> wow it's crazy texas is big <laughs> understatement <laughs> uh all right well I, I wanted to highlight just a few things for folks from last week's talk do you remember we talked a lot about um the recognition of software as part of the research endeavor or not last week, but two weeks ago. Um, I had a conversation kind of the next day with Dan Katz, who's at Illinois, who some of you may or may not know. Uh, and I just wanted to highlight a few of these links for you because there are, it looks like, several policies that might be useful to some of you just when it comes to thinking about software as part of the research endeavor. So if you want, they're in Slack as well, but you might want to take a look at these as they might be useful to you. So this is, um, yeah, Sean, you were actually also like asked, because I think at Missouri, you had gone through the process where software was a considered component. Yeah, a, re a research output. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it, uh, it took me, uh, actually, it took the, metrics from chaos to make that case okay <clears throat> um yeah i made i used uh, auger to make a promotion case four or five years ago okay did you so, feel like you were able yeah. to change things at the university or was it just for you i think i think i was able to seed some thoughts and i think there are others who produce software who are finding ways to get credit none of them are using chaos um but I, I, I think I think I provided an example way of narrating the software contribution at my university and my college. Okay. If you would ever like to include yeah. this in the I list, could. I think yeah. it would be helpful for folks. I mean, it's more of it's more colloquial, I would say, than than okay. these standards things, right? It would be the examples I have from here, but okay. I'd be happy to share that. Um, yeah, let please. Me, um, let me make a a note, note here. Okay. Yeah. It was just something that had come up last week. All right. Um, any comments on that? Hopefully that's helpful for folks at their own universities. Um, today, I, I did want to spend a little bit of time. I'm not sure quite how long this will take, um, but I'd really like your feedback on some ways of thinking about things. So over the course of months that we've been talking, um, I have the sense that different Different universities kind of have different focus on what they're looking at with respect to open source and uh, the research or the university university endeavor. And so part of, I think, when we approached this was how can chaos metrics be used to provide insight on the things that you care about at your university? So like, how could you use pieces of software to identify metrics that you could use to demonstrate success or areas of improvement around, um, again, things you care about with respect to, to open source at your university. I don't know how far that went. I have this, I'm getting this sense that a lot of you are working in kind of operational centers where it's not necessarily always about just creating metrics to, to observe the world around you, but it's to create programs that kind of foster and assist people to think about open source as part of their education program, or as part of their research endeavor. So it's kind of, it's, it's a little bit flipped. And let me tell you a little bit about 
why I was thinking this and maybe what a relationship here is in chaos. So we, in chaos, we do obviously create quite a bit of software and quite a few metrics uh, that can be looked at things kind of retrospectively. So for example, Sean had mentioned Augur, the Augur software. And you can use the Augur software to take a look at, for example, um, say repository activity. So things that are occurring within a repository around say pull requests or issues or commits, Sean, you can elaborate on that, but it's kind of a, it's a, it's a look backwards at what has occurred. And if software is a significant part of the work that your lab does, then it helps to like, but it helps to describe the repositories that, you know, your team has contributed to. So express that as a sort of percentage or express, you have to express the significance narratively depending on where it lies. Yep. So, and so those tools can be helpful and they can be helpful. I think for folks on this call, um, however, I, there are times I, like I said, where I think you're, you're thinking about metrics as a way to help people and support people. And we have a program here at the chaos project. It's not necessarily related to this group, but it's around the creation of a, of a DEI.MD file. And we're asking open source projects to create a DEI.MD file and reflect on four particular metrics that help them better center DEI within their own project. So for example, we were working with GitLab where they have produced a DEI.MD file and it talks about how GitLab as a community is thinking about say paths to leadership or their newcomer experience. And in this case, metrics aren't necessarily something that, that we're measuring. We're using metrics as a way to get people within communities to think about particular diversity, equity, and inclusion issues. So it's, it kind of flips metrics on their heads a little bit in the sense that you can use metrics to look retrospectively at things, but you can also use metrics to encourage people to think about particular things moving forward. Measurement or not, like these are just, these are metrics that you should probably have on your radar as you're doing something in particular. So I was thinking about the, do you remember this? The, the goals that we had kind of established. And some of you maybe don't remember this because maybe you're seeing, you're coming in a little bit later. Um, but we had kind of as a group talked about, you know, what are the areas of interest that say a university OSPO might particularly care about? And so when I look at this, I'm thinking maybe not everything is a retrospective look where we would use a tool like Augur to try to understand, for example, research translation or research development, that we could actually take a look at metrics as a way to um, support the activities around research development or research translation. The way that the DEI.MD file is not a retrospective look at a community, it's a way for a community to think about particular DEI issues. All right, so hopefully this is making sense. Um, so if I was to take a look at, at these goals, you know, one of the things, if I was to stay in the upper left-hand corner as an example, like what would be the metrics that, that you would care about or kind of put in front of people to get them to think about how to advance research through the use of open source. So there may be something that you're doing within your OSPO where you're doing outreach work with researchers at your university and you're trying to get them to think about how open source can play an important role in that. You, you all can correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm, I'm sensing that there's a, a large outreach component for what you're doing or you're trying to understand um, how open source, that second point, how open source is a driver um, for impact and funding. And as a group, you're thinking about what would be the metrics we would like to think about when we're considering um, open source as a driver for impact and funding. So again, not all of these are retrospective looks. They're, they're ways for you to think um, about open source within your university kind of going forward. I'm gonna stop there for a second and see if anybody has like questions about where I'm going with this. So I'm gonna need your input or ask for your input. Or are you stunned into silence? <laughs> you want me to talk about something else? <laughs> All right, I'm gonna continue on. So within the chaos project, we've been developing um, insight guides. 
And these are guides that Don Foster, who I don't think is on the call today, but Don Foster has been putting forward to help corporations, a different OSPO, um, think about how metrics can be useful for particular areas of interest. And so as an example of an insight guide, um, she developed a, a guide called responsiveness. So again, maybe applicable in the university sense, but it was certainly applicable in the in the corporate sense. So a lot of corporations care about the responsiveness of the communities that are that are within their you know field of view. And there's good there's yeah. there's pretty good grounded research behind why that is because we know that if a pull request or issue gets a quick response, then that person's more likely to continue to engage with the project. So corporatized open source does this because they want to encourage newcomers. <laughs> That's why they pay attention to that metric. Okay, cool. Yeah. And so the insight guide is structured as such that we have three metrics in this example where we have, to Sean's point, like change request closure ratio, time to first response, and time to close. And through the insight guide, Don has taken time to provide a narrative as to not only why these three things, only three things, there could be many more, but just kind of three initial things to think about with respect to responsiveness might be important for an organization. So she goes then into detail about the first metric, which is time to first response, and how you might go about kind of interpreting or understanding the trends around time to first response, and so on and so forth through the other two metrics. She has a step two, so diagnose what you're seeing to take action, and then gather additional data if needed, and then continue to make improvements. So there's a structure to these insight guides, which is trying to help people locate what would be the metrics that you would want people to think about on a particular issue? And as people gather information around those metrics, how they might, one, gather that information, how they might diagnose it, and how they might think about improvements going forward. So it's kind of a structured process by which you would help people think about their engagement with open source. In this case, it's around responsiveness. These are not necessarily meant to be technical implementations. They're meant to be put in front of people, again, kind of like the DEI.md file, to get people to reflect on particular metrics that, that you would like to think about or you would like, say, researchers to think about when they're thinking about, in this case, responsiveness. All right. So if I was to, to return to this, part of what I was thinking is, you know, what if we were thinking about research development within the organization, what would be the, the guide that we would want to put in front of people to help them think about the engagement of open source or the, the role of open source in research development? What would be the things that we would want people to think about? Whether or not you measure them within your organization or not, you know, within your OSPO, just if you were to talk to researchers, like here, here are a couple of things that we think you should be paying attention to. Here are the metrics that we'd like you to reflect on when you're considering the engagement of open source with, in this case, research development. So and to Sean's point, the responsiveness was a very particular case for corporatized open source. So what I'm proposing is, is that as we kind of go around the circle, perhaps we could start creating guides that would help not only your organization think about these particular issues, but also help others think about the metrics that they should be caring about or thinking about when they're trying to, in this case, connect open source with their research endeavor. Is this making sense at all? I have an example. Yes. David. Um, I'm struggling with this a little bit because sure. when I'm knocking on doors and talking to people, it's um, the majority of the researchers that I'm talking to open source about are not software engineers. Um, and so they are not coming from that company background. Um, they're not already like used to project management and all that stuff. So it feels like yeah. there's a big barrier of entry. 
Um, and the metrics that they would want to be, I think, understanding are how can how can jumping from like just me developing my thing on my laptop and not having to worry about documentation or anything, how can collaborating with other people in general help me be more innovative? How can it make the code stronger, more secure? Um, how can it be more inclusive? Those are the kind, I don't know how to do those metrics, but those are the kind of metrics to like get people over that hump. So is it, um, so I think that's a great example. And is it when you're knocking on the doors, is it um, you trying to help people kind of locate themselves in moving out of, like you said, just a you know software development on a laptop to actually doing it from a community perspective? I mean, my charter here is to grow an open source community. Um, and so <laughs> to letting them know what resources the university already has, okay. um, things like GitHub, enterprise and, and co-pilot that might be able to help them but they're like deer in headlights they're like well i'm not really a coder um <laughs> you know and i don't necessarily want to be a, they don't want to be maintainers in general mm -hmm. so there's just a a lot of people that are scared uh, of taking that jump so, and there are some people that have really done a good job and excelled sure. and and so you know they're like okay we can and but even even they are not necessarily doing agile development they're just sort of doing some collaborative development so, so in that situation um what are the like maybe two or three things that you feel that the conversation centers around a lot um i don't know the answer the the main thing is they're already overworked and they feel like adding all these readmes and trying to build a community is going to be more work and they're not sure it's going to be worth it for maybe the short depending on the, like how big they, they don't know like what they want to actually do with the project the people okay. that are excited are, have ambitions to to make a big community and and either sell something or or maybe make it move into a corporate you know solution yep. or to just build an open source uh, like a I don't know. I just call it a beautiful open source community because they like open science and they want to go that way. Yep. So um, when you when you run into that situation where folks are like, I don't know why I would do this amount of work to create a community, like what's in it for me kind of thing. Like, what's your answer? Um, <laughs> <clears throat> my answer is we have a reproducibility crisis in science and that this work, it is more work to do good science um, and that we, we have an obligation to do it and it will be a little bit more upfront, um, but it will pay dividends in the back end. And I'm just hoping that that's true. I don't have any metrics to, to verify that. Um, yeah. And then I also like, I, I, I make it clear over and over again, we are not going to mandate anything. We think some projects are small and it's not right for them to, to put all these, yes. you know, things in place so it has to be the right size project to, to make those steps okay so i heard i stephanie i definitely see your hand but i heard about reproducibility as an argument and doing larger scale science um stephanie yeah i just want to say i think david that that's a great approach the way because it's that idea of not it's not one size fits all but then showing kind of the longer term um resiliency of the work being um being what what the payback is that, that what you're working on isn't just going to go away that there's and that's i mean that's something that we're struggling with and, tr and trying to figure out the best kind of um way of presenting that to our community is that you know what we are trying to do is to make sure that the best uh, research is not lost and that people can build upon it. And the reproducibility crisis like that you were talking about, I think was really, is really like a really critical thing to point out. So um, I like, yeah, so I just wanted to like reiterate, I think that that is a really good, good. I think that's a really nice approach and way of talking to your community about it. So on this conversation, um, David, what I would, and Stephanie, what I would 
I think where this would fit is um, assuming you find the research groups that are candidates for building community, yeah, not the small ones, but the ones that um, uh, would be candidates for doing that. These insight guides would then be available to these researchers that would say, if you're going to build community, here are say two or three metrics that we think you should start focusing on as you're doing that community development. And here's why. That's what the insight guide would be about. And so the metric in that case could be, I'm making this up at this point, but the metric could be say return contributors or sustained contributors could be a metric that you might want to care about with respect to community sustainability. Or to Sean's point, even the one that we showed with respect to responsiveness, like ensuring that you as a community manager are responsive to, to new participants in your community. So like those would be the types of insight guides. That's what an insight guide would provide is some guidance for folks to move forward on metrics that they should probably be caring about. And it's not something that we are necessarily metric measuring retrospectively because we just don't have the data yet, you know, um, but something that we could encourage people to think about and center in their work. And I think that would actually perhaps be a metric, I'm sorry, an insight guide that would fit here on this slide 10 around community. Does that help at all, David? Sort of? I think so. Um, I'm, I'm interested in what Sean posted. I don't understand. Um, uh, so, so that, you know, if you've got the researchers who, you know, they're not really thinking about growing a community, then just some simple things like doing releases of the scientific software they're working on periodically as a way of adding just a small amount of software engineering formality to so that they're communicating with others who might want to take up and use the project they've created. And Matt, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to <laughs> dismiss what you're saying um oh. i'm just really struggling with the those are fine i feel like the metrics you're talking about are more for after a project is up and running in in some kind of a good stead um and i'm struggling with like creating projects from nothing or from very like how, to, how to even get over that hump in the first place yeah so any metrics i would want would be convincing people you know, other projects that have done this have had okay. like more innovations or more security or gotcha. more inclusion, you know, so this is it's better in some better way. reproducible, et cetera. You know, so this is another reason to go this way. I gotcha. Um, does any, Stephanie, do you do that at UCC? At, like by creating community around your project this is what has this is what has come of it do you track any of that like this is this is why you do it this is why you Sorry. create a community um we do for the we have for other projects that we we were previously funding through cross so that was a relatively small and now that we're moving through and kind of doing the ospo effort we're seeing how much larger or how many more projects there are out there and so we're just getting started really on even though we've been doing this for a few years now, we were really just getting started on having, getting those metrics in and having those discussions. Um, okay. It was kind of setting our feet and being, it was it was that push-pull thing, like it's hard, it was hard for us to find them, but now that we're finding them, they're all coming to us. At the, it's kind of one of those, oh, he, where have you all been all these, this time? But it's like, oh, you've been there in plain sight, but I we just, we're now seeing you all. So that's what we're trying to do. And that it was a good, I mean, you know, I'm just having discussions with people the last few weeks, um, really an uptick in, in the number of people talking to us and being able to point to, you know, chaos and the metrics they have, because those are that's a huge question for them, for like, we have people who are doing like pose phase two grants, and they're asking that question. And I'm like, well, you know, like, here is, it's nice to have a lot of what you're working on, because I can go to that. But then there's also, again, like kind of what Dave was talking about, which is those ones that are small, but we see that there's value in it. They may not see that it's valuable to, 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 they don't, they have less of a, an understanding of the bigger picture maybe as researchers, because their head's down in, in what they're doing. And that's where, I think that's where our, like the larger ones are a little easier, but is those ones where it's like, there is a value to it, but how do you, um, 
how do you kind of get that to the researcher to show them why it's useful for them as well as for the the, the rest of the research community for them to maybe make these little the extra efforts and, and pay attention yeah, to yeah. no that's interesting um I really appreciate this conversation. Oh, I can just tell you a long time ago in the corporate space, I had a an NSF grant, which was exploring why companies participate in open source and then how they do it. And so really the first set of questions were, what, why would they even do this in the first place? Which I think is to your point, Dave, like why would a researcher, as the correlate, why would a researcher even participate in open source in this way in the first place? And if you can't answer that question, then it really doesn't matter how you would participate because <laughs> you haven't you haven't gotten past the why component. Um, has anybody else on this call struggled with this why this why issue and and have found a way? Um, Tom put something distinguishing between metrics and goals for researchers' personal goals. Yes, versus project. Agreed. Yeah, Francesca. Um, yeah, so uh, I have also struggled with the why issue, but and, and have not yet found a solution. Um, but I think one of the biggest challenges is trying to uh, address so many different audiences' requirements. Um, I I like the point earlier where you know when you're talking to a research group, they may not have a software engineer, and so they're um, motivations for developing open source software may be very different from you know a lab that is fully fleshed out with their own RSCs and um, people who are specifically dedicated to just maintaining um, their open source software community. And so when we when when I speak to these different groups and then there is also this group that has little to no experience in developing open source software, but loves the idea for their research domain and would like to adopt it. It feels like the why has sh shifted slightly every time I've talked to the group or that I feel like I'm tailoring the why frequently depending on the audience that I'm uh, speaking to and have yet to find some kind of consolidated uh, why that will appeal to all the many different audiences, um, but that could also in itself be uh, sort of the solution because that is what I've been doing thus far, even though it feels uh, strange for me to like have a bank of four to five different whys, but each audience is just getting the one why. Um, yeah, exactly, Tom. Okay, yes. Um, how do we, how do we share these different whys? It seems like a couple of you are having the same issue as to why a group would want to participate in open source or, you know, a project would want to participate. Um, Tom, I know you're in a crowded place, <laughs> Francesca, like, are you just doing this, um, do you have it written down anywhere? I guess I'll just say, <laughs> or are you just kind of doing this from experience and you just kind of know the audience when you, when you see it? Um, I'm actually working with, um, uh, working with someone for, who works in industry OSPOs. We're, we're yeah. trying to explore like what, like an assessment questionnaire would even look like um, to try and get at that. Why? Like, that's actually kind of the homework he gave me this week is like, are there some common questions you can ask across all these different meetings? Because I, I brought that up with him last week where I said, every time I meet with a different research group, it feels like the why is, is, is different. And then, as I said earlier, it also comes back to like, um, I often ask like, well, is this what, what you want to do? Or is this what is being required of your funder? Mm -hmm. Or is being required by your funder, which I know is a is a big part of the conversation now. Sorry, that was kind of rambly. I just no, no, no. I I think that's with your you had put that earlier. Do you see my screen? That earlier comment in. Yeah, I think that's you were. I think that's what you're talking about, right? Which is just you want to personally do this, or your funder's making you do this. Um. 
Francesca, do you have anything? So it sounds like maybe Tom would be <laughs> willing to maybe share a, a model to figure out the Y component. I don't know if you could. The the um the the thing that um Saeed and I are, are working on this spring, we we fully intend to share out uh, okay. with a larger group. So that that that's like an express intention of the person that we're working with that we're trying to do something that's not going to be um so specific to CMU, but it's more about trying to do some type of questionnaire or assessment that kind of like tackles this for universities in general. But that 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 just like th th this kind of came out of very much what Francesca was talking about. I was like, I like I feel like every conversation I come out of is very bespoke and tailored and trying to find these common threads has been a challenge. Thanks. Um, Elizabeth? Yeah, I was just going to make a comment. So um, early in my open source career, I worked for a company called SourceForge. Uh, it was a platform that hosted open source projects, kind of a precursor to GitHub. And um, if it makes you all feel any better, the board of directors, there were a bunch of companies that were owned in this umbrella. The board of directors had no idea what open source was and why anybody would even contribute to this. So, <laughs> and they owned SourceForge, which was an open source platform. So I think it's a common thing. Um, and I'm just wondering if there is some kind of um, misunderstanding or maybe it's ambiguous. Uh, like what, how does open source work? What is it? Why would someone contribute? You know, if it's even like to that basic level of not even so much as like, what is this, how does this benefit me per particularly, but uh, how does it work? And like, why is it a thing? Is that, would, would that be fair? Is like, is that a question also that there's just kind of a, um, not a great understanding of the the foundation of open source and like why it's, why it works and why it's a thing? I guess that's a question for anybody on this call. I'm just curious. It's like, no, they get what open source is. They just don't know why they, this, institution in particular would want to participate. David or Tom or Francesca, if you've been doing this, are you running into that issue? Like it, it seems like it's a question even further up the chain. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I would say um in terms of the why open source specifically, I don't feel like I've personally encountered that question. I think there is for certainly people who have approached us or people we've approached to understand what open source uh, software is and the processes involved. It doesn't seem like the making of things open source is the question. Okay. I think one one of the bigger whys is um, I, I so as I work as the technical community manager and so. A lot of what I'm doing is looking for community opportunities. And I think that's more of the sort of why, um, in part because you do have this range of um, how fleshed out a project is. And, you know, it's sort of like why as a, you know, fully fleshed out, um, you know, working project, uh, are we kind of like in a community with, people who may not um, have sort of the same goals as us. And then we also take that as a feedback loop with um, their why, as in their goals and how we can support their why. Um, but I would say that I have not personally encountered the why open source question that um, frequently. Um, I'm not sure if David had a different experience. No, I agree with that, but that's, I think because I'm primarily reaching out to people that are already <laughs> have some sense of open source, okay. I think there's a lot of professors, faculty, staff, even that have no experience with it. Um, I also add that there's um, there's so many other opens. Um, so open source software is one. We actually have one of our customers is already talking about open source hardware. And then there's open data, open access open scholarship, open research, there's all kinds of different names. Um, so it's, it's um, that's part of the challenge, I think. And then you have things like 
open AI that drive me crazy and we have to fight against. <laughs> it's not open. Um, just noting Doreen had a comment in the chat as well, kind of the why geared towards the objectives or goals of, of each of the projects. Uh, all right, so as always, the, these conversations are really helpful to me. I think I was reaching a bit into the how under the assumption. All right, so David, you put something else in there. Do you want to, I'm going to grab that. Do you want to talk to that? Sorry, I just, this is just a quick thing I put together, very informal for some website content. And it's just some th bullets that came to my mind. I'd be happy to, happy to obviously to share, but I was curious if other people um, have others or you know that's a, that's a kind of list that I'm looking to this is more from a um, just an individuals why would you want to join a community at all be a contributor at all you know so it's more of that focus than than cr from a maintainer expect of creating a project but um, yeah so thinking on the along those lines Okay. Any 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 other marketing pitches? I'm I'm very excited to I like it. <laughs> put up there. I want to grow the community? Of course, Francesca. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Well, th this just reminds me of, uh, or this is a very nice link to the previous meeting about you know making software, uh, a valid or viewed as a valid research output, and I do get the sense that when you know when that is boosted the why will also become more concrete if not anything but you know for a researcher if not anything but to actually just have this other valid research output feels like already a great um answer to why this is an important thing so i just wanted to highlight that this is <laughs> quite a nice link to the um the previous uh meeting where if that gets done, then this also uh, gets done pretty nicely. It's nice to know that we're connecting our thoughts <laughs> between weeks. So that's a good thing. So thanks for pointing that out. Um, Sean, I'm going to ask you a question. Are you here? Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm I'm just reading all of David's things and processing the conversation. I mean, is there I don't think there is any way, but tell me if I'm wrong. Like, is there any way that we can understand um how how academic open source projects or projects that originated in universities have had a positive impact or like through Augur, I'm trying to think if there's any way we can look at the trace data of the growth of a project over time. I, I don't know. I, so I think I think it requires putting the projects into categories. And the categories really are around, you know, that first question that David had, are these, if faculty is not interested in the community and they have a small scale project, then what we would look at for that scale of project, which we could approximately classify just looking at activity of people involved those things those questions are going to be different the things we can help project or researchers understand are different for these smaller scale projects um and i think so if we start that way so yeah the short answer is yes i think the the longer answer is we have to decide how we're going to classify projects so that we can look at them in the right way for, for so that we can compare apples to apples. David's hand is up. Save me. <laughs> Sorry, I you just triggered a thought I had. Um, I had a really a great conversation with somebody doing building an open source tool called um, Fair Share, um, and it's it's designed to run against a GitHub GitHub repo, um, and see how fair the code uh, all is. Um, it's the similar same fair concept as as for data, but they're applying it to code. And so, you know, making sure the metadata, you know, readmes are there and that the, the right fields are in those metadata readmes and some other things, you know, to describe the code. And um, I think that's a, that's a, that would be a really cool metric to say, okay, this repo um, is meeting the FAIR standards to some level. 
Yeah. And I know, I know Dan's worked really hard in the last several years to try to get the, the fair standards for software to reflect software, not data. Cause the, the fair data, I mean, as a person who works with software and data, you just have to measure them in completely different ways. Um, so I think, I think that's a, a good strategy because that, you know, like checking that certain pieces of metadata are in the readme, I think is real similar to my suggestion of just seeing if getting them to release software regularly, right? It's just like a small signal to other people outside the project that it's some degree. Cool. Um, I think this tie ties back to um, the DEI markdown that you were mentioning at the very beginning too, which I'm really excited yeah. about, you know, having things like that, you know, are, are things that you can, you can measure. Does this repo, you know, have this, how inclusive are they? Um, so I, I, I just, I think that's valuable. Yeah. And it's it, the things that we would do to advance inclusivity are the same things we would do to try to grow community. So if, uh, researchers interested in outside contributions, perhaps from those who consume the software that they're generating. And, and those communities of people consuming it can be really small sometimes in science. Um, that's I think that could be a plus, you know, because then that researcher isn't solely responsible anymore. The other plus is you can have tools built to support the researchers to say, okay, here's a template. You know, these are, rather than them thinking this is a burden adding all these things it could become you know here's the templates will help you do it you just fill out something that the fair shared tool is designed to help do that with software you know oh you, mm -hmm. you missed this readme here's a here here's a template of one and then it um hopefully reducing the burden because the last thing we want to do is is make all this harder on the researchers yeah. who are not necessarily coders isn't remy doing stuff like this Sean, do you remember this? Or Elizabeth? Yeah. Do you remember this? Remy's at Health and Human Services. Yeah. He he's his philosophy is always to talk about heat, light, and love, right? And and heat would be the amount of activity. Light might just be people um no. looking. Oh, I think he had a, a kind of a formal mechanism. I'm oh, look. yeah, he has a maturity model. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. And it yeah, was so so I would say he's putting together to help people mm -hmm. do exactly what you're talking about, David, which is. Yeah. Yeah, he does. Some, of, I would say some of the things aren't necessary if you're, if you have smaller scale, you know, lab with three contributors. Um, some of the things on Remy's list might not apply, but many of the things would. Let me see if I can dig that list up while we're still here. Yeah, that would be, but that really. Um, to your point, Dave, you can convince people to want to build a community and it, it'd be nice if you didn't just say, well, great, back yourself out. Like, <laughs> good luck, you know, go look at other communities. But if you could um, standardize or templatize the way that that gets done just to help people off the ground, that'd be great. Um, we're almost out of time. I just I quickly put a link into the fair share. Um... Okay. App that I was talking about. It is tailored to data, but they're trying to expand it to um to to code. Okay. Um well, you know, one of the things I think so uh first of all, thank you for this conversation. I'm always trying to figure out ways that we can help each other. And it honestly, it sounds like one of the first steps is overcoming this why component. <laughs> so which is which is great, why you would why you as a project would want to engage in open source. Um, and it seems like providing folks with a consistent way to help people understand that would be great. Tom, it sounds like you're doing work in that regard. Francesca, it sounds like you're doing work in that regard. Um, and David, it sounds like you're doing work in that regard. Um, could we, how do we, how do we get the three of you to, overlap the things that you're doing. There, there's no need for us to redo this time and time again. Should we just wait for Tom to deliver what he has to deliver? I'm trying to think about like the best ways to get this done. You can think about it more too. Sean, one of the things that I want to try to talk to you about in between now and the next meeting are 
for example, anything that David had put in here? Are there ways that we could use trace data as a some sort of proxy to indicate? I don't think we can do the versus closed development, but just say that innovation can be expanded over time in a community through some representative metric. Yeah. Um, so these questions right here that you've got highlighted, yeah. take those and come back with some thoughts after the next meeting, I think is what you're asking. Yeah. That we I will do that. That we could, because I think this would maybe help David strengthen his argument. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. you know, say that we're, we want you, this helps you connect with a global community of engineers and scientists. And take a look at the data here. These are projects that originated in open source, and you can see that their community has grown globally over the course of the last two years, for example. Um, and in doing so, it's, you know, whatever it's done, it's increased the contribution rate um, by a diverse number of people across the globe. Yes. Would that be helpful, David? Like those kinds of metrics? Yeah, possibly. I mean, okay. the, the real metrics that are helpful for researchers are citations. And well, this is for you. Yeah. These are for you to have the why conversation. Mm -hmm. That's, yep. So it's just getting there. I think it sounds like we have to get over that hump a little bit first. And I, I think producing software that others can consume is an antecedent to citation, at least in my experience, if you can get that far. Well, yeah, actually, actually, I understand David's question now, right? If you could walk into a room and say, by building this community, you get this many more citations. <laughs> yeah, I can't make any claims like that, but. Yeah, <laughs> or this much more money than. <laughs> it can be aspirational. <laughs> <laughs> I understand your point. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, we're at the end of time. This is super helpful. As always, I was reaching for something and y'all brought me to a, a different spot and i really appreciate that so um we'll continue this conversation in a couple of weeks so have a have a great rest of your day and have a great rest of your week all right take care Bye, everyone